Hello everyone and welcome to our session today, Patient Experiences and Consequences of Taste Changes, What Should Nurses Know? Our presenter is Anna Bolton, Head of Cancer Information and Support Services with Cancer Council Victoria. Anna is an accredited practicing dietitian who has recently submitted her PhD entitled Investigating Taste Dysfunction in People Receiving Chemotherapy. Anna has a background in public health policy and training, nutrition education and dietetics management. Her research was inspired from a lack of evidence to support her clinical work in managing oncology patients, self-reports of taste problems and loss of food enjoyment. Anna has a master's qualification in nutrition and dietetics as well as gastronomy. She has recently been appointed as Director of Cancer Information and Support Services at Cancer Council Victoria. Welcome to the microphone, Anna. Thanks, Sue, and hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar by the Cancer Council Victoria, partnering with the Nurses for Nurses Network. Uh, and the title of this presentation, as you can see, is Patient Experiences and Consequences of Taste Changes, which is in inverted commas. What should nurses know? We'll talk about the inverted commas in a moment. The presentation I'm giving today was requested by Sue after hearing an interview I gave via the ABC Radio National First Light program with Michael McKenzie earlier this year. And that interview focused on a program of research that I've conducted over the last three years into taste problems experienced by people receiving chemotherapy, as Sue said. The title of the presentation may better have been known as What Nurses Want to Know because the content of today's presentation is informed by direct research with oncology nurses as well as other practitioners around the, the types of support and information that people want to, to help better manage patient self-reports of these types of problems. Some of the information is quite cancer specific as that is my area of expertise, but the learning is hopefully applicable to other clinical conditions as well. This is me. Uh, I, as Sue said, are, are proud to be uh, Director of the Cancer Information and Support Service at Cancer Council Victoria. I also retain an Associate Research Post at Peter McKellen Cancer Centre here in Melbourne. And I am a dietitian by trade, but I do like to think of myself as an honorary nurse. Um, and that's partly because I was trained and mentored by nurses throughout my PhD and completed that uh, program of study within the Department of Nursing at the University of Melbourne. As Sue said, I chose to undertake a PhD in this area because I really grappled uh, with supporting cancer patients as a clinical dietitian with taste problems. Um, it was extremely frustrating to not be able to adequately answer patients' questions around uh, how long these sorts of problems would last for, what they could do about it. Um, obviously, dietitians make recommendations to try and improve the nutritional status of their patients, but when uh, food enjoyment was a problem, that was a real barrier to uh, obt or attaining those nutritional goals. So. As Sue said, I do have a master's in, in gastronomy, which is around um, the art and science of good eating. Um, and so my passion for food and, and the role of food in life uh, is extremely important uh, to myself and obviously many people. And so um, that focus really uh, came through in, in this research looking at how we support that food enjoyment if we really want people to, to meet those nutritional goals they have. These are the elements I hope you'll come away with a better understanding of after today's session. What taste is and isn't. What I call the sensory and hedonic determinants of an altered eating and drinking experience. The causes and consequences of taste problems. Current clinical practice regarding taste problems and where some of the gaps are. And how we might better use patient reports to guide our approach to supportive care. I plan to present for approximately 40 or 45 minutes today and then address questions posed by you at the end. 
So you'll see a Q&A function to the right of your screen and my preference would be to address any questions typed in there at the end of the presentation component. So I'll store them up for that time. Whoops, I'm just going back one of the slides. Um, the, the session is going to, to run uh, according to the schedule and the first section is an overview of the research I conducted as part of my PhD which was uh, divided into four um, sections. I'll then move on to some of the theory and some definitions including uh, the sense of taste and what contributes to the broader concept of the phenomenon we know as flavour and I'll then move on to the clinical challenges that this poses including a real life patient inquiry from our cancer, Council Victoria Helpline and then with some key messages and then references and resources uh, for you to follow up if you wanted more information. And then as I said we'll move on to the question and answers where I'll endeavour to address your inquiries directly. So I hope that sounds okay. Now there were four separate but related studies which composed the three year research program of my PhD and I want to touch on these briefly now um, to give you a sense of how the evidence base in which I present today was created. So study one involved auditing 200 medical history entries for patients treated for head and neck cancer who'd received care by a dietitian. And this audit involved the notes of 30 patients. What I found uh, when I looked at those notes is that 22 patients had taste problems documented by a dietitian. So it was quite a common symptom. But only seven of these patients had specific strategies documented to address the problems listed. The terminology used in this documentation was extremely variable and it made it difficult to really understand the true sense of the problem um, and that could lead to nebulous management uh, of the problem. And we'll go on to see why that is um, and partly it is that clinicians feel unsupported in terms of having adequate information to, to accurately and, and like I said uh, adequately support um, patients in that area. So that, that was by no means a criticism of the dietitian that was just trying to get a snapshot of uh, the current state of play when it comes to writing uh, and, and preparing plans about and for taste problems. In study two, interviews were conducted with nurses, dietitians and medical oncologists to get a sense of the language used by clinicians and patients to discuss case problems and to investigate current practice and challenges faced when supporting a patient who reports case problems. It was clear from this study that clinicians needed more information on how to classify the different types of problems described. So for example, food tasting yuck compared to food having no taste at all are quite different issues uh, and the most appropriate ways of addressing these were not clear. So clinicians were saying in terms of what they needed and one of the questions was if you had uh, one thing at your disposal to help support taste problems, what would it be? And what they were saying is that it was some kind of classification system that really helped characterise what the specific problem was um, and then adequate support information and therapy to address those particular issues. But I started to get the sense by now that we need to break down the problems into uh, more detail than lumping everything under the, the general heading of taste problems and that will come out as we move through the presentation. Study three involved interviews with patients and carers. Patients participating in these interviews had experienced what they understood to be taste changes during their chemotherapy treatment. So we, we uh, recruited participants from the day oncology ward at Peter Mac and asked people who had been receiving chemo uh, or um, had finished chemotherapy recently if they experienced taste changes during that time and if they said yes then we invited them to be interviewed. And I asked them what they experienced exactly and what that meant for how they felt and what they did. And these interviews highlighted that the symptoms patients understand as taste problems in inverted commas vary widely and require varying approaches to management and support depending on the nature of the symptoms that, that, uh, that leads them to experience. The consequences were categorised into three main areas, gastronomical, social and emotional consequences. 
and we'll go on to talk about those uh, as we go throughout the presentation. That last point there, self-management over advice given, really addresses the information I was getting back from these study participants that uh, they are not well prepared by health professionals for the taste problems they experience uh, and they didn't get specific information, at least that's what they reported to me. So they were using uh, trial and error and, and self-management techniques to try and um, overcome some of the symptoms that they had experienced. Finally, study four followed 52 patients receiving chemotherapy for breast cancer from before chemotherapy until two months after chemotherapy had finished. And I measured their taste function, their appetite, their liking of a standard sweet and savoury food, dietary intake and nutritional status at six different times each over this period. And if on average people were receiving chemotherapy for approximately six months, then I followed people uh, for around eight months um, to, to collect up that information two months after their chemotherapy had finished to see what their patterns were across uh, a longer period of their, their treatment trajectory. And this study gave us a lot more information about the factors which affect food enjoyment during chemotherapy treatment. And it showed that those patients with the greatest changes in taste function from baseline, from before their chemotherapy started, were on average likely to consume less calories and protein and have a decrease in BMI compared to people whose uh, taste change did not deteriorate quite so much. So now I want to define taste, flavour and other related components of the eating and drinking experience. Knowing the difference between taste and flavour is really important because in order to address a problem adequately, we need to accurately define what it is we're talking about. So to start with taste, taste is one of the five senses through which we experience the world. And it's defined as perception on the taste buds of five basic taste qualities, which are sweet, salty, sour, bitter and umami. Some of you will have heard of umami and it is sometimes known as the fifth taste and it's characterised by a savoury taste which might be reminiscent of uh, stock, uh, chicken soup, that kind of taste, uh, parmesan cheese, um, a meaty, a hearty stew, um, Vegemite, things like that. So those five basic tastes form the building blocks of the, the bigger perceptive quality which is flavour. So I like to think of those a little bit like the primary colours when we think of uh, the world of vision. So obviously when we eat food we can perceive many more than those five basic taste qualities and that's because there's other inputs that interact with taste to enable us to do that. The function of taste or, or the, the properties of taste I suppose are elicited when food is uh, broken down by saliva and those chemical molecules from the food are able to interact with the taste receptors on the taste buds and they are present in the, the tongue and the oral cavity. So that interaction is the only thing that is taste. Anything other than that is part of flavour. So the sense of taste comes together with the sense of smell and touch which is around uh, something called chemesthesis and that's really about hot and cold temperatures and oral irritation which includes things like uh, the, the sting or astringency of um, a sour beverage or perhaps uh, olive oil or something like the effervescence of uh, a sparkling, a soda water or another sparkling drink. So all of those uh, physical senses come together to support the wider application of flavour but also there's inputs from what we call food hedonics and as some of you will know hedonics is defined as the extent to which uh, an experience in life is pleasurable. There's two components of food hedonics which are appetite and food liking and I've defined those there. Appetite is about the wanting or the desire or motivation to maintain eating and sometimes relates to certain types of foods. 
Food liking is defined as the anticipated or immediate experience of pleasure from eating or drinking the food. And then there's all the perceptual and cognitive uh, factors that also input to flavour, which is about mood, it's about um, setting, it's about the food memories. So all of those things work together. Some examples of taste problems are listed here and it's really, this is really putting some of the detail around uh, what goes into that overarching banner of taste problems. I know that la the label taste problems encompasses a whole lot of things, but here are some of them derived from the experience of patients that I spoke with in my studies. There are certainly changes in intensity that centre around the basic taste qualities that I talked about. Some people describe that food becomes uh, really overpoweringly sweet or bitter or perhaps they're needing to uh, add more sugar to food because they don't have a sense of sweetness much anymore at all. That can happen uh, across the board, so there's a general reduced intensity and everything tastes a bit bland, I'm sure you've heard that described by patients before. Uh, but then there's also changes in food hedonics or food liking. So it means that a food might taste the same. So for example, tuna might still taste like tuna, but for whatever reason, that taste is no longer enjoyed. And that is an important distinction because if we're thinking about therapeutics uh, going forward to try and manage taste problems, knowing that that's not an issue with uh, taste on the taste buds per se is, is a really good in, uh, piece of information and it's really around um, food liking and what kind of things can affect uh, that acceptance of food at that level. How much we desire a food at certain times and whether a food is liked in a particular context uh, along with you know, the memory and what else is going on at that time is, is a really important determinant of how food is perceived. Um, and those attributes are sometimes confused as taste. So, you know, I hated the taste of the pumpkin soup on the chemotherapy day unit. Might not have been the taste at all. It might have been uh, the smell of that soup going by and the person didn't even actually get to taste it as such, um, but they were put off that because they were feeling nauseous or they were feeling anxious and so on. Patients commonly report a reversal in liking of sweet and savoury foods where a person with a sweet tooth will go off their favourite foods and food aversions can develop, like I said, and in the chemotherapy context, nausea is obviously quite a common side effect, but as is anticipatory nausea, and that can happen in other clinical settings as well, so perhaps before a person went to hospital um, to receive some other kind of treatment, the foods that are eaten at that time, or smelled in fact at that time, uh, can become aversive for many months indeed. One patient uh, who had some peripheral neuropathy said that foods had a, a pins and needly taste and of course that's not one of the five basic tastes but that was the sensation that he was experiencing when he, especially when he was tasting very cold liquids uh, that became actually quite painful such as uh, beer is one that he spoke of um, and ice cream. Unpleasant tastes in the mouth are reported by patients which typically include an offensive taste or a metallic taste and that metallic taste can refer to a constant metallic type taste in the mouth rather than the food itself, for example meat tasting like metal, although that can also be reported. Food tasting like cardboard or straw or, or like something else which is different from before are really uh, common reports as well. So you can see in brackets there that I put in uh, titles around what these things are which are not taste on the taste buds but they're problems with thermal sensations which can result from the type of drug, so that was more common with people who were receiving oxaliplatin for example, which um, where neuropathy is a problem. Uh, oral sensations can come from all sorts of uh, problems in the mouth and we'll go on to look at that now and, and obviously oral dryness affects uh, the way that food is, is tasted or perceived or enjoyed. So then, what are the underlying causes of such problems? Published evidence suggests a few key medical conditions and treatments can cause taste and flavour problems. Cancer itself does not cause taste problems, but some other metabolic and endocrine conditions do. 
And I say that because it's more the treatment for cancer that causes the problem in the taste arena. In kidney disease, we know that a high concentration of some compounds in saliva, such as sodium, bicarbonate and urea, affect the perception of the basic taste qualities in their own rights, as well as reducing overall taste sensitivity and improvements seen in taste perception following dialysis. A study in kidney patients has also shown that people with chronic renal failure have less taste buds on the tongue than did healthy controls. In liver disease, oral bacterial overgrowth and a high prevalence of periodontal disease exists, especially in alcoholic liver disease, which is probably no big surprise. And taste problems have been shown to exist in a small number of studies in, in some other conditions as well. In cancer and other diseases, oral surgery removes tongue surface and taste receptors. Radiotherapy causes scar tissue to form and saliva and gland dysfunction, and saliva is needed for taste perception. Chemotherapy also alters the perception of sour, salty, and umami taste qualities, is what I found in my research, but interestingly, did not alter the ability to identify sweet or bitter foods, which might suggest that these tastes, in fact, become more prominent during treatment, and that might explain people describing a metallic taste, which is actually a bitterness that's described as metal. You'll have all heard about or perhaps experienced alterations in food preferences during pregnancy, and taste acuity can be seen to diminish in ageing, and in particular, sensitivity to bitter taste changes over the course of a lifetime. So some of you might have experienced that yourself. Uh, I certainly know I have um, moving through from early adulthood to, to middle age, dare I say, um, where my tolerance uh, to bitter or the perceived in intensity of bitter has certainly changed and that is not about food liking for me, that's about how strong the bitterness of grapefruit or uh, a gin and tonic, for example, used to taste and how it does now. So some of you might also recognise that in yourselves or, or in family members. So what then are the consequences of these taste problems? Why do we care? Well, in my research, the category of consequence was divided into three main areas. Like I said, the gastronomic consequences, these are not about what was eaten or how much, although it does include that, but also refers to the how and why of eating. During chemotherapy treatment, flavour problems meant people were using food at times as a source of fuel or reported just to be eating for the sake of eating rather than for pleasure and, and this was a, an unwelcome and surprising change from before. Emotional consequences varied and were largely neutral or negative so patients either just got on with things and understood that these side effects were just part of treatment uh, or, or it disappointed or frustrated them. And this is often dependent on how important a role food played in their lives. So some patients spoke of, uh, you know, really noticing that and worrying about when their taste function was going to come back, if it ever was going to come back. And one patient spoke of um, how joyous she felt uh, when she tested a favourite bread that she used and she knew that throughout the course of a chemotherapy cycle uh, her taste problems or her taste function would start to improve and so she would go to this favourite bread of hers and taste it and, and know that if it tasted okay and like it should then uh, it was getting better and that was quite reassuring to her. And other people talked about the excitement of the, the taste function uh, coming back after chemotherapy had stopped. There were social consequences of so-called taste changes relating to the dining context. One carer talked about the fact that there was no real point going out to dinner with her husband who was a patient like they used to on a Friday night because she said it would be like uh, sitting opposite her husband who was eating a, a plate of chaff um, and there was actually no point doing that. And this couple also reported that um, they, they were from regional Victoria and they also mentioned that when they came to Melbourne where their treatment uh, was being received that historically for them it had been a place that they came for good coffee and um, good Asian food down in Victoria Street which is our you know, hub of uh, Vietnamese restaurants there. And 
they didn't do that anymore and in fact um, instant coffee with powdered milk was something that this patient just carried with him because that was an adequate substitute that coffee was so unenjoyable for him during that time. Uh, and now instead of hitting Victoria Street for um, you know uh, some spring rolls or, or other good Vietnamese food, uh, they would go to get ginger sweets to try and get rid of this uh, offensive taste in the mouth. The research obviously showed that there were consequences for patients, but a really big thing that came out of it was the challenge that clinicians face in managing some of the taste problems, and I imagine that's why a lot of you are tuning in and listening today. Part of the problem that we have is there is no standardised language, so the words that we use to describe all of these problems that I'm touching on uh, don't really give good clues about what the problem is. So. For example, food tasting like wet carpet, which uh, clinicians report patients say, uh, might refer to an altered sense of smell or taste or texture, dryness in the mouth, all of which require different interventions. To determine if a problem is truly taste function or some other component of flavour, chemical tests are needed where solutions mimicking the five basic taste qualities are given to people to sample. And that's what I did during the research. So. There are set uh, standardised food-based chemicals that are used to mimic sweet, sour, salty, bitter and umami. Uh, they're made up at, at different concentrations and people sample those until they're able to elicit a particular taste um, and can identify what it is. So these aren't routinely used in the clinical setting and in fact there is no routine method of assessing taste. Uh, in that setting and certainly no clinical guidelines for the management of taste problems. So oncology clinicians report that strategies to manage taste and flavour problems are less concrete or lack evidence compared to strategies used to manage other toxicities of cancer treatment. For example, clinical guidelines is, exist for mucositis and, and nausea and vomiting. Historically, access to detailed and accurate information regarding the cause of taste problems and useful strategies to address them has been limited for both patients and clinicians. And the reason for this partly is that this information was unknown, or well, there was no evidence base for it. There's some really unhelpful and incorrect information that exists, such as suggesting that patients use a straw to bypass the taste buds or to use plastic cutlery or not to cook with metal implements. Uh, as I said, no evidence exists around those. I feel a little bit like old sort of wives tales that, that go around. Um, but certainly we don't know whether using plastic cutlery uh, enhances the food enjoyment aspect for patients and I imagine that it probably doesn't. There's insufficient evidence that zinc or the drug and the phosphine indicated in the treatment of serostomia in head and neck radiotherapy is useful in managing taste problems and in fact it's contraindicated and that comes from uh, a recent systematic review on the topic. So what we do have however is that high level evidence uh, exists for preventative dietary and educational counselling ahead of problems occurring. And this means that providing patients with preemptive information about some of the taste related symptoms they might experience so they can be prepared for them and take prophylactic or at least proactive steps to minimise unwanted symptoms is really, really important. What do patients say helps? Patients themselves who did experience taste problems say they wish they'd have been pre-warned so they could have planned differently and had better control over food enjoyment. Patient reported self-management strategies include getting creative with food seasoning and I have had reports of patients who say they've bought the salt box over to next to their meal on the table and they've just continued to add salt to the food until it elicits the flavour when they were going through taste problems. Others, depending on uh, what their food world was like to start with, uh, have experimented with sharper or more savoury flavours um, and, and that's preferable on health grounds as well, although um, you know, looking at sodium content of the diet at this time isn't necessarily a high priority, but certainly using other flavours might be more effective than using salt alone, especially if dry mouth is a problem. 
Patients who complain of sweet or salt intensity increasing have had to steer away from certain favourite foods and replace them with less intense alternatives. One particular man told me about uh, dried anchovies that he used to really enjoy and how he replaced those with the Spanish bocalon or the uh, white preserved or pickled uh, anchovies instead which are far less salty. Another woman described uh, having to steer away from mixed breakfast cereals that uh, include dried fruit in them and just going to a really plain style because even the dried apples in the cereal were really overpoweringly sweet and that was a change from before. Depending on symptoms, chilli can be tolerated less well or actually used in abundance to add sensation if people are having uh, lower taste intensity in general. And I've, I've heard stories of uh, patients being banned from cooking at home because they put in so much chilli, it sort of blows everyone else's head off in the family, but um, they need that amount to, to get some kind of tingle out of food. And then it, on the other hand, like I said, if there's uh, neuropathy or neurotoxicity going on, uh, even the slightest amount of chilli can be extremely overpowering. Very cold foods can be a problem or certain foods a patient's finding aversive might need to be avoided for periods altogether. Common culprits for food aversions are chocolate, coffee, beer, wine and citrus fruits and juices and that's been found from my patients but throughout the literature as well. And there are some similarities there when uh, you think about pregnancy and what foods people become aversive there to as well. In my study, I found that liking of sweet foods decreased significantly during chemotherapy treatment, but liking of savoury foods didn't. And that's fascinating when I reflect on the practice of dietitians and other health professionals around prescribing extremely sweet supplement drinks to patients going through treatment who say that they have a poor appetite. There might be a gap in the market there for some product development. If patients experienced a bad taste in the mouth, they sometimes brought an eating event forward or they grazed or had a flavoured drink to try and eradicate that taste. They just wanted to get rid of it. And, and that uh, is effective in a very short term, but it can be problematic in scenarios where weight gain is an issue. And I raise that because my major study was with people who had breast cancer. Uh, being overweight is a risk factor for developing breast cancer in the first place. So the cohort I had certainly were an overweight uh, cohort on average uh, and quite significant amounts of weight gain was observed during the study period, uh, in some cases up to 10 kilos over a six month period. So the old uh, approach which is, you know, eat what you like now, we'll think about that weight gain issue later, may need to be revisited. Knowing that taste and flavour problems were a common and expected part of treatment meant that patients were more able to just get on with things. So telling them that taste might be an issue it is important but it's not enough. We need to go through the range of possible symptoms. So patients uh, expressed that they were told their taste buds might go metallic and that was the extent of the information that they received. And part of the issue is that um, the job is not clearly owned by one profession. Uh, so dietitians are often, or, or nurses look to dietitians to manage the problem and actually often dietitians are saying, well actually we don't know what helps. So this is a multidisciplinary issue. Patients often ask how long taste problems will continue on for. And in the chemotherapy context at least, patients usually notice some resolution of their symptoms toward the end of a single chemotherapy cycle and it's important to ask them if they see this because if they do, then it would indicate that their taste changes aren't permanent. In chemotherapy alone, most patients will have resolution of symptoms by two months after the completion of chemotherapy, so we, can, we have an evidence base now to say that, whereas patients who receive radiotherapy ahead of neck cancer can uh, have quite prolonged symptoms. This case study is a real life scenario cut and pasted directly from an email sent to me from a cancer nurse in my team who had an inquiry come through on our Cancer Council helpline. And I'm going to read this out to you now. 
Hi Anna, I wonder if you could help me with a client question. I had a carer call and her husband has been on a new trial for metastatic melanoma with brain mets over the last two weeks. He has no appetite because he has an awful taste in his mouth and I wonder if you have any suggestions. He was on dexamethasone for brain mets, he has a clean mouth. He does have a little nausea and only takes him two times per and daily so he suggested increasing this to three meals four times a day. It could possibly relate to advanced disease. Appreciate your help, Robin. So although this whole inquiry might be labelled under the general heading of taste problems, and I think that was Robin's uh, email title, uh, in the first instance we can get a bit more specific than that in order to guide the most relevant response. And what Robin's been able to do in this email to me is pull apart and unpack some of the information that she's been given to really try and drill down to, to what the issue is. And let's look at that now. So an unpleasant taste in the mouth means that food is less desirable and or enjoyable for this patient. Nausea is strongly associated with appetite and Robin's done well to make suggestions around improving nausea control and the patient's mouth has been deemed clean but I, I'm unsure uh, to the self-management techniques that are being used for this but I'm sure uh, Robin spoke with the patient's uh, carer about that. We also know that dexamethasone can act as an, uh, an appetite stimulant rather which the patient's on so that's good and the patient has advanced cancer so our management goals may potentially be more focused toward food enjoyment rather than aggressive nutritional therapy but this obviously requires an individual approach. So my suggestions in addition to what Robin had already done would be to check if oral care could be enhanced through more frequent rinsing brushing and flossing and whether adequate fluid was being consumed because uh, having adequate lubrication um, and hydration in the body in general uh, will certainly reduce the risk of um, an unpleasant taste in the mouth. I'd be looking from a food point of view at food and drink based suggestions which help override this unpleasant taste and this requires experimentation depending on the, the patient's palate in the first place and their food experience. So patients report commonly that ginger is extremely helpful and some of you will have heard that as well. Uh, ginger in drinks or tea or pickled on food or as ginger lollies, ginger ale or syrup. And then grazing on different fresh tasting foods uh, which have a lot of water content I suppose like berries or slices of fruit have been reported to be helpful. And then other Asian style flavours uh, such as coriander, soy, chilli uh, can be useful, those fresh sort of flavours. Or rinsing prior to meals to try and eradicate the taste is a good idea too. If meat is a particular problem, sometimes because it's like I said it's commonly aversive, people can say that it tastes a bit bitter, but also it can require a lot of chewing um, and if there is some kind of uh, I guess um, secretion into the saliva that's unpleasant because of an oral infection or something like that, chewing will just intensify that experience because more and more saliva will be produced at the time. So having an easier chew meat alternative can be useful and some examples especially if they're good sources of protein as well uh, which are helpful at, at egg based dishes to, to give you um, some practical information. So as you can see an individualised approach is, is really, really important and, and I guess talking through the elements that you can assist with in a case study there isn't new information for nurses, um, it's just about trying to match the particular information that's received uh, to the tools you already have in, in your toolbox. The point of an individual approach to management is that we as health professionals need to understand the problems which may be perceived as taste in inverted commas in order to suggest the most appropriate approach to management. And a problem with smell would have a very different approach to an offensive taste in the mouth or dry mouth to the point that all food tastes like cardboard. Patients do need to be warned about the scope of changes that might occur and I, I list them there and that's, that's a much better start than um, just taste alone. Often just the sheer acknowledgement of, of the loss of some of these functionalities is comforting to patients and the time taken to work through ideas for, for food alternatives. And that's important information for nurses, dietitians and doctors. As an ongoing piece of work for my research, I've developed a framework 
matching patient language to likely symptoms and then suitable approaches to management. So that framework is divided up into sections which are titled if a patient says this and the next section is it is likely to mean this and it's matched to those different elements of flavour and then we can match the information, some of which is clinically ready from our toolbox and some of which needs further development to address those symptoms and that will be worked up in trial with clinicians over the coming year. This slide, uh, can, sorry, the last slide completes the content base of the presentation and this slide now gives you a bit more information on some of the things that I've talked about and you can look at the references if you like which are publications from my study which go through uh, the results of, of the studies that I've talked about today in more detail. The YouTube video you see there is uh, a film or a short video uh, filmed on site at Marina Hospital in 2011 which interviews me and one of the, the study participants when the breast cancer taste study was just starting. This slide, uh, which is the last slide, provides a link to the radio national interview with Michael McKenzie and you can hear the entire interview here and also download an information summary about the research. Practical information from my research has been incorporated into this publication which you see here from the Cancer Council released last month, so it's brand new, uh, it's national and it can be ordered online and on the front page of the brochure image you'll see there our Cancer Council helpline number and that's a national and confidential service staffed by specialist oncology nurses that provides practical support and information for, among other things, cancer treatment related symptoms and the nurses can refer cancer patients carers and health professionals to credible sources of information. So I leave it there and I will start looking at some of your questions um, to try and answer those. If you haven't posed any and you have some now, please type them in the box that you see and I'll start to turn my attention to some of them. Thanks very much Anna, that was a really interesting presentation and I'm so glad I followed up after I heard you initially interviewed. May I ask, with the chemotherapy, did it, were there, did different drugs cause different problems or was it a, a similar problem irrespective of the chemotherapeutic agent that was being used? Yeah, thanks Sue, it's a good question and uh, a common question indeed and uh, I guess the aim of the research uh, unfortunately wasn't to go through every type of chemotherapy and look at uh, which ones cause most problems. It was really uh, to try and um, study groups which were receiving one type of chemotherapy uh, to look at whether there were other factors, clinical or demographic factors for patients which were causing the problem more so than the drugs. So for example, um, the breast cancer study were people receiving anthracycline uh, or taxane containing chemotherapy and we were able to look at what was happening to them as a group. Um, nausea is a problem within that group uh, and appetite more so than perhaps some other types of chemotherapy which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and, and that came out really through having contact with these people during the study where uh, their food choices change based on their changes in appetite rating, perhaps more so than taste changes, although if you would have just had a brief conversation with them uh, as a, a nurse on the ward, they would have probably described that, that food tastes terrible but actually if you, you drill down and, and measure it's around uh, appetite or changes in food liking. With the people that received oxaliplatin, for example, um, there was that neurotoxicity element um, which is more specific to the platinum compounds uh, and so that sensitivity to hot and cold was really something um, that came up whereas they recorded less food aversions um, and you know smells being offensive and so on, perhaps because their appetite was better. So. I think to, to answer your question, we, we uh, have a little bit of a sense about which chemotherapies might be worse than others, but I think the bigger driver of uh, symptoms is around the patient's personal experience and how well they're managing some of their other symptoms. Mm -hmm. And you, was it your study that identified that uh, the 
taste does come back within the two months time frame. So it takes around two months. Yeah, that's right, Sue. Uh, that that was probably you know over three years. <laughs> that one little sentence was the most valuable thing that we we could tell people. Uh, and look, it, I say it with caution because it does vary, but on average, mostly people who just received chemotherapy, so not receiving radiotherapy to the head and neck area, their symptoms had resolved by that time point. And that's what was coming out of the interview study uh, with GI patients at the start. And that's why I chose the eight week mark or the two month after chemotherapy mark to measure taste again, because people at the start were saying, look, by about two months afterwards, it, it came back. So we wanted to measure that very systematically, mm -hmm. and I was able to do that. And certainly when you look at the chemical tests with taste per se, um, that taste function was right back to, to baseline, which was a really reassuring thing to be able to go on to say pa to, to patients who ask that question. Certainly, because it provides some level of hope, doesn't it? And and it's, it identifies a goal that you can uh, look forward to. It does too, and I think it's uh, we often want to give patients hope uh, in the absence of any evidence around it. And so I know as a, a junior dietitian, I was more. Uh, I had a tendency to say, "Oh, look, it might not last forever," but actually, we didn't know. And I think to be brave to say we don't know. Um, but to check whether patients are experiencing any resolution at any time at all, like at the end of a cycle, for example, will give us a hint about whether it would ever come back for them. And certainly the medical oncologists were saying that, you know, patients are asking me about um, planning a particular celebration around food and, and asking advice about whether they should delay that um, on based on their symptoms and so on. So this two-month time frame um, is really a, a bit more specific and, and can be helpful and is based on evidence rather than us saying, well, look, it might take years when, when we don't know. And I think it's great to be able to say that the evidence suggests or the evidence identifies mm. because then people... Um, I, I also think it validates what they're experiencing because when people, in, in my belief, um, in, in the diagnosis of cancer, mm. such big things are happening in their life that sometimes they think, oh, taste is such a minuscule thing, That's you know, right. I won't worry about it. But the reality of the years, it does impact on every social interaction that they usually have. Absolutely, Sue. Um, you know, every meal, every... Um, you know, every day really. So uh, it, it's not to be underestimated, but mm. you're right, it, it often does slip down the priority list and patients themselves might feel like it, it's not important enough an issue to raise um, given they're going through a, a life-threatening illness. Um, so, you know, it, it's a supportive care issue that is a problem for patients and, and I think if this research helps us to, to do better helping them manage that, then that's a wonderful outcome. I agree. We've got a question from Bree. Anna, yeah, um, I can of those. see those. I did want to talk about that. That's great. Okay. Thanks, Bree. So that question is around people with radiotherapy to the head and neck area, which I've indicated is quite a different scenario. And what was the recovery time for taste changes in that population? And Bree, that population has the, the most uh, published evidence around it, but it's still extremely limited. So the study numbers are small, um, you know, in their tens rather than hundreds or thousands. But certainly there was a study um, that suggested that it can take up to two years. Uh, there were a, a few people in the study that still had not resolved uh, complete taste function. And it's important to say that taste buds regenerate really, really quickly. So they have a lifespan of about 10 days. Um, you know, obviously chemotherapy is, you know, fast killing. Um, it, it, cells are destroyed very rapidly, but they, they also regenerate very rapidly. Now, the difference with the head and neck group is not around the taste buds being damaged as such, but more that salivary dysfunction, where if salivary is not produced, uh, it, it can't interact with the food molecules and uh, act as a conduit to interacting with the, the taste receptors. So that's a real issue. I can see there that there's a, a question from Rosie as well. Um, Rosie's asking if there's evidence that a pre-dinner snack uh, or a, a pre-dinner alcoholic drink um, can act as an appetite stimulant. And I, I don't know if there's evidence as such, but I think there probably is anecdotal information that that um, 
can be a useful thing to do. Again, with suggestions like that, I would probably uh, ask patients to try those things and, and see if they worked. Um, we wouldn't want them to be, we, you know, we obviously wouldn't want to be encouraging um, alcohol intake if they weren't someone that normally did that anyway. Um, but, you know, if, if they were partial to, you know, a small drink and had one and found that their appetite was stimulated by that, then um, that, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing to do if they were struggling to, to get enough food intake. So um, it, it is commonly reported, I do, I do hear that. I didn't hear it in my research, but I wasn't looking specifically for that. So I think that's um, worth trying as a strategy as well. And then may I ask, did you look at any adolescents or, or children? No, I didn't see. The, uh, there was a reason for that, that adults, uh, well, I guess the eating problems in children could be different from adults. and so. The inclusion criteria for people in my study was that they needed to be aged 18 or upwards um, because of that issue around uh, homogeneity. Again, if we study people that have lots of different um, clinical attributes and personal attributes, it's really hard to understand uh, what it is that's causing the different symptoms. Like I said, children um, you know, have a higher acceptance of sweet foods, for example, than adults do. Uh, they tend to uh, be less tolerant of bitter foods. So to mix samples like that um, would have confused some of the data, mm -hmm. but certainly there is quite a body of evidence around children and food aver aversions um, and how, how to manage some of those. And I know one particular study looked at uh, giving children uh, a novel food for something they'd never experienced before, um, before chemotherapy, such as a, a coconut lolly, for example, um, and then giving them that again um, after treatment and, and looking at how acceptable it was to them. And certainly they remembered novel foods that weren't um, part of their usual diet and they associated it with that time and were less willing to accept or, or eat as much um, of that food at the subsequent time and that leads to suggestions around avoiding foods which make up uh, an important part of the nutritional content of your diet before treatment um, in case an aversion does develop but that's, that's probably, that could fill the content of another hour's lecture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fabulous. And look, thank you very much for the presentation today. It's very interesting. The nutrition and cancer document is that downloadable as a PDF or it's only order, uh, you can order it as a hard copy? Both. Oh, great. And, and the links there um, are provided. Fabulous. So, and it was your work that is identified within that document? Yeah, that's right. So there's a small section on taste changes. It, this document uh, includes quite a lot of information about different food and nutrition topics. So. Um, the taste component is quite brief, but it certainly is evidence-based and it flowed from the study. Fabulous. Anna, thank you very much. Today we've been listening to Anna Boltong, who is Head of Cancer Information and, Su and Support Service with the Cancer Council of Victoria. Victoria. Anna, thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. To everyone who's listening, I wish you an absolutely fabulous day and I look forward to seeing you online at another webinar very soon. Goodbye.